so I thought I'd look at um, the first movement of Beethoven's Opus 18, number three, Quartet. You'll know that a lot of these classical chamber works, and as well as, well as symphonies, bigger works as well, are divided into different movements. Um, four tends to be a standard, sometimes three. Now, um, it tends to be the case that the first movement is structured in a particular way. And we often call this first movement form or sonata form. Um, and it's a very, very dynamic type of form, which sort of expanded, you know, blew out of all proportion in the 19th century. Um, and in these days, in these classical times, um, the form was, was sort of finding its feet, but it was, it was quite well established. And it's a form which has lots of different themes, lots of different melodies, lots of different tunes. And quite often, um, I remember when I was young, I was, I was always amazed at how all of these tunes were sort of coming at you from all different directions. Never quite sure how they kind of were structured, how they were ordered and what the relationship was between them. And there's, there's an infinity of different ways of thinking about how these, these different parts, these different themes are structured in terms of the dynamic whole. W-H-O-L-E, not H-O-L-E, it's my northern accent. The dynamic whole of the work. Um, and I'd like to just explore a little bit of that today. So, um, first off, it's worth saying that the form has essentially three distinct parts. Sometimes four, depending on how you look at it. But in, in a nutshell, three distinct parts, which I'm algebraically calling, in a very simplistic way, A-B-A -A here. Um, that tends to be thought of as a kind of departure and return narrative. It's a bit like in this pe period of coronavirus isolation. Um, we're all desperate to leave the house. Um, you know, imagine we manage to do that somehow or other when this is all over. Um, we'll be perfectly happy with returning again. And once we're away, we'll be desperate to return again. And that's exactly what happens in this kind of narrative. The A and the B and the A section actually have um, other terms which are associated with them because they each have unique functions, even though the A is very, very the A section at the beginning of the end are very, very similar. Um, the opening A section tends to be called the exposition because this is where these, all of these different themes which we hear are exposed. It's where they're introduced. We then have this section um, called the development section where these themes are kind of often broken down into their constituent parts. They are given new harmonies. It is a really, really dramatic section. It can often be very, very turbulent for reasons that we'll come to shortly. We then have the recapitulation section, which is very, very like the exposition section. In fact, in some sonatas, it's rare for it to be identical, but it can be identical um, to the A section, except for one crucial adjustment, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, this sense of you know moving away from something stable to something unstable and then returning back to the stability is tied in with what we would call the key structure of this music. In a nutshell, if you're in a key which we could relatively call a tonic, it's, uh, that tends to be used for whatever key the piece is in, we would call that key the tonic. Um, it kind of provides us with a bit of kind of you know, relief when we turn back to it. It's the area of home. Let's say the tonic there is C major, for example. If we move to the dominant, which is actually a fifth higher than the tonic, um, the dominant chord would be this, or the dominant key, and that needs to return to the tonic ultimately. Now that's just three chords but you can imagine though how on a, a much larger level, a kind of macro level, we can still have the same sense of tension um, which is you know uh, injected into the piece and then resolved towards the piece's conclusion. Now the exposition section, if you look at that in this diagram you can see that on the bottom of that tonic and the dominant um, we start off by the way, this moves from left to right. It's like the piece starts there and finishes there. But we start off in the tonic home, and then within the exposition itself, we move to the dominant. We move away. Um, then when it gets to the development section, we move through lots of different keys. We're kind of really kind of, um, you know, getting restless feet there. We're really moving around very, very quickly. And then we return to the recapitulation. Now, in terms of the themes, the actual melodies that you hear, the tunes, they will, or they generally, will be in the same order. They will be exactly as they were in this exposition section. But the crucial difference is that now everything from start to finish is in the tonic key. So everything is home. And it's like a big kind of, um, you know, reaffirmation of this tonic. 
It's as if we've overcome this this urge, this uh, need to move away, and we re return to it back um, with uh, sort of extra vigor, extra sort of lust for life, <laughs> a life of home. It doesn't feel much like we want to stay at home just now, does it? Um, right, let's have a look now at this slightly more complicated layer of this diagram, this one here. It's not loads of complicated algebra, um, it's just simple, a couple of letters that just stand for a few key terms. P there, tends to stand for primary, okay? Um, because it's the, it's, the first, it's the first theme that we hear. It's also called primary because these set, it act, actually can be a few different themes, but they are, they are all in the primary key, which is, tends to be the tonic, okay? So P stands for primary. This then is the primary theme, and we'll hear that in a moment. In fact, let's hear it now. primary theme is finished, we then tend to have a, a period of transition where we move from the primary key area, okay, which is the tonic, in this case, by the way, that's D. Um, so we move away from D, we move into the dominant during this period of transition. So you'll, you'll hit, start to hear the, um, the kind of the initial stability start to break down. It'll become just a little bit sort of destabilized. Um, and that is the transition section. Now it's quite common for a transition section, a transition theme, to be a, a completely new theme in its, in its own right that just happens to move through different keys. It's also very, very common, um, it certainly happens in this work, that in fact you start off with a, with a primary theme again, and the primary theme kind of becomes this transition, it starts to go off, uh, you know, it leaves home you know, in terms of theme as well as leaving home in terms of key. It's like there are two different strands, there's the themes and there's the keys, and there's a kind of dramatic interplay between them. So we'll now hear the transition from the primary theme becoming a transition from the string quartet here. Now the transition there starts to come to a kind of inexorable conclusion where you know that it's leading to somewhere new. Um, and the place that it leads us to is firstly a new theme, but secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it leads us to a new key area. And this new key is the dominant, or in this case, A, A major. So we now have a, a few different themes, all in A major. Now, you see the, the acronym there, S, that stands obviously for secondary obviously because P was primary. Um, it would be strange if secondary, if S stood for something else. So that is a secondary um, theme. But you'll also see that there's little um, numbers on there, little superscript numbers, S1, S2. Now what they stand for is those are the different melodies, essentially, or the different themes that happen within this secondary key area. So within the dominant key, there are numerous different themes. It, it doesn't have to happen that there are more S themes than there are P themes, but it does well, It does often happen. In fact, it's, it's, it's usual that there are a few more S themes or secondary themes than there are primary themes. So we can see here then that we have S1, S2, S3, and they are all in the dominant or A major. There's a bit of a, a, bit of a strange thing here because this one, S2, is actually in C. It's actually not in A. We'll have a look at that in a few months' time. Let's listen, first of all, to S1. Mm -hmm. 
a beautiful, lively, a Boolean thing there. Um, let's now listen to S2. S2 will sound a little bit ooh, strange because it moves to the key of C major. Um, C major is it's kind of related to A major. If, if it was A minor, not A major, then C would be the relative major. It's a kind of minor third relationship. But it still does sound a little bit ooh, distant. And then it would be weird if Beethoven just kept us in that C major all of the time. I think we kind of probably instinctively, whether we know it and cognitively or not, would somehow or other instinctively feel that that's got to return to normal. So we do, in the S3 theme, spoiler alert, return to A. But let's firstly have a little listen to that S2 theme. And then we have the S3 theme. Again, all of these themes are quite lively ones, very, very much in character of the movement. Quite often the themes will take different little twists and turns um, and give you different, different emotional um, responses or different emotional places to go. But quite often they are all within the general character. And in fact, if we wanted to go much further, we would see how on a very, very micro level, these, these themes are all kind of transformations of each other. There are only one or two kind of little ideas here which are being transformed into different themes. But perhaps that's another story. Now the exposition tends to close with um, a theme which tends to give you the feeling that yeah this is all going to come to an end any moment now and um, it feels like yes this is this is just um, well, it's not just about it it's important but it's, it's got a closing function it's like drawing it to a close so we'll call this C which we're just using to stand for closing theme sometimes it could stand for codetta that that's a term which often gets used a closing theme here which again serves to really re-establish a major so here's the closing theme Now, it's important to realise that the A section is often repeated. There's my attempt to draw um, musical repeat marks. So often this A section, the exposition, is repeated. Moving on to the B section though, it's very very common for the B section to have a few key, I mean it's, a, it's it, firstly it's a bit of a free-for-all. Um, there, there are so many things as a composer you can do in the B section to make your work extremely dramatic. Um, you know you can really take us um, on, a, on an, ultra, um, an ultra dynamic journey here. Um, but there's a few sort of key, thing, key ways of doing that. One of the common things to find at the beginning of a, of a development section is the main motive, the main theme, but usually reharmonized into quite a sort of strange, uncanny, otherworldly harmony. It could just be that it's in a minor key. Sometimes it's over a very kind of dramatic, diminished type chord or something very, very strange. Um, let's see what happens in this development section. That's usually a kind of opening um, sort of gambit for a development. It, we will then move through lots of different keys quite rapidly. Um, and you'll find hints of the previous themes. They often actually come in the same order that they appeared in. They don't have to, but it's quite common for them to kind of rotate like a carousel, but in the same order. Um, and then they will be you know, cast into different keys, different relationships. Sometimes new little themes will emerge. So that's quite a special moment when that happens. Um, they will usually draw down towards what we call a pedal point and um, when you know we feel like something's got to give we're about to go back to the new key that does happen here though it is a bit of a strange one i have to say um let's have a listen to this development section and you'll hopefully see how some of the themes that you've heard before the p the s1 the s2 the s3 not necessarily in that order are um i suppose reconfigured recomposed worked out in a different way
okay now. The recapitulatory section, the recapitulation, um, is where we feel like, okay, we're back, we're back where we started from, thematically and tonally. We come back to the tonic. Part of the reason that the development section tends to um, end on this very, very strong, we call it a standing on the dominant, this long kind of pedal point, low down, um, makes us think, right, we've really got to get back to that tonic now. And then that release of energy into that recapitulation is often a really sort of significant moment. In this one, it's a little bit more subtle. Perhaps you can explore that um, yourselves and, uh, you know, or with me another time. Um, but we now have everything that we had before in the exposition, just all of it is in the tonic. Um, we don't, it's not quite true. Composers do tend to recompose things often quite significantly, um, particularly in the 19th century. The recapitulation can be very different to the exposition. There's often a lot of truncation going on. Sometimes even things appear in the wrong order. In this recapitulation, we don't, we get a big return to the primary theme, as we did before, back in the, the tonic key of D. But unlike before, where we then started this transition theme with another restatement of the primary theme that became the transition, we kind of just cut straight to this transitional section, as if we're actually starting the recapitulation, the equivalent moment, here, rather than here. It's, that's one way of thinking about it. Um, the key moment, really, is when the transition, which initially moved us into a new key, it, it felt like it was turbulent and moving us towards something new. It does exactly the same thing. It makes it feel like it's moving us towards, and then it kind of at the last minute hooks us back to where we were and says, actually, you think you you think you were going away again, but we're not. We're staying put. We're going back to where we started from. So then we return um, back to the tonic. And all of these themes, the S1, the S2, the S3, and the closing theme are now all in the tonic, whereas before they were in the dominant. That's part of the major drama of this whole dramatic structure. Let's have a little listen then to the recapitulation, but I'll stop you just before the ending. I'll stop you just before the ending. So there we have the recapitulation. What follows next then is not necessarily there in all of these sonata forms of all of the different works, but it is in this one. And it's 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 a relatively reasonably long coda section. Beethoven tended to actually write quite long coda. A coda is a, a section which should really be just affirming that tonic just a little bit more, just taking hold of you and saying, remember we're in the tonic, we remember we're in the tonic, and really fixing you to that, that sense of, of home. Um, it will often just give you a kind of a couple of snippets of maybe the, the main theme. In this case, we actually seem to move like we're almost modulating to somewhere else. And then Beethoven just brings us back nicely to, to round the piece off with this little coda. It's worth saying that sometimes Beethoven, I mean, for example, his famous Fifth Symphony, can really give us some long codas. 
and he really puts he almost makes like an alternative development section it's not quite true here but it is just a little glimmer of things to come so we'll listen to the chord event to close this um this short little overview of the idea of sonata form it's worth when you're listening to other works particularly chamber works in the classical era trying to remember this kind of narrative not necessarily in the detail but just remembering those three main functions of the exposition the development and the recapitulation and listening out for those and trying to get yourself into that um 18th 19th century sense of drama and the very very intense sense of narrative coherence that comes from that particular type of form so i hope you've enjoyed this i'll leave you with beethoven's coda